So this is uh, joint work I did with uh, Alex Scott uh, last last month, and uh, let me start by talking about background a bit. So uh, I mean, you're all grad students, well, pretty much, right? So you I mean, don't, don't have to do the background, but but anyway, so. You know what the chromatic number of a graph is. You know what the clique number of a graph is. Clique number just means the number of vertices in the largest complete subgraph. And we care about the connection between the two. Certainly the chromatic number is at least the clique number. And it would be nice if there was a reverse inequality. Um, but, but there really isn't. You can have graphs with clique number two and chromatic number as large as you want. Yeah, I think so. This is the theorem you were telling me. I'm not talking about girth. Not girth. No, no just, just uh, click number two and chromatic number as large as you want. Um, it really isn't true, but on the other hand, it would be nice if it were true, and people put some effort into into repairing it. I mean, how how can we? What do we have to do to make there be some connection between omega and chi? Um, a hole means, so the uh, most obvious graph where the chromatic number is bigger than the clique number is an odd cycle. The chromatic number is 3 and the clique number is 2, except not a triangle. For a triangle, the chromatic number is 3 and the clique number is 3. But odd cycles of lengths bigger than 3 have a chromatic number bigger than clique number. And that's a hole. What I'm doing induced subgraphs. A hole means a, uh, an induced subgraph of a graph which is an odd cycle of length, which is a cycle of length bigger than three. And I'm only going to care about odd holes. And an anti-hole is just the same thing in the complement graph or the complement of this thing in your graph. If you exclude both holes and odd holes and odd anti-holes, then you do get a connection. They're equal. And that was a famous problem of bearish for a long time. We solved it in 2006. So, so that's nice. That's done. Um, but that's, I mean, it's such a nice problem. It's a pity to stop. I mean, can we, can we milk a bit more out of it? So, so if I give you a graph, if all I care about is induced subgraphs, and I give you a graph and I tell you its chromatic number is bigger than its clique number, then you can deduce it's got an odd hole or it's got an odd anti-hole, and that's all you can deduce, because maybe it is an odd hole or an odd anti-hole. There's nothing else to say, if all you know is that its chromatic number is bigger than its clique number. But what if I tell you its chromatic number is much bigger than its clique number? What if I tell you its chromatic number is much bigger than its clique number? Can, maybe now you can prove something better than just that it's got an odd hole or an odd anti-hole. And it's a conjecture of Jarfesh that in that case you can prove it's got an odd hole. That's this. If you don't have any odd holes and the clique number is bounded, then the chromatic number is also bounded. And uh, that was, when was it, 85? There were actually several conjectures of this form, that, uh, mostly by Jarfash, I think all by Jarfash, that uh, if you have a, a graph with bounded clique number and huge chromatic number, then it can, must contain this, or it must contain that, or it must contain the other. So there's a conjecture, it must, for any tree, it must contain that tree as an induced subgraph. There's a conjecture that it must contain a whole of length at least n as an induced, maybe I'll write them down, somebody come back to them. So for every tree, so if uh, the clique number of G is bounded and the chromatic number of G is going to infinity, is huge, sufficiently large, then for every tree, uh, T is an induced subgraph, or let's say G contains T, as an induced subgraph. Um, and for all n, g has a whole of length at least n. And 
and G has an odd hole, and that's the conjecture I put on the slide. And even more generally, that for all n, G has an odd hole of length at least n. So this one implies the two previous ones. Um, and there was another one that wasn't due to Jarfesh, it was due to Kalai and Mushulam, that, that uh, there exists a hole of length 0 mod 3, or an induced cycle, so triangles count. And this one's done. This one was recently done by, uh, by uh, Thomas A. and uh, um, I've forgotten the other two authors. Anybody remember? No, I've forgotten the other two authors. Never mind. But it was recently done just this summer. Um, and it was that work that Alex, Alex Scott and I decided we didn't want to read their paper. We wanted to find our own proof. So, and we had a clue how they did it. Thomas A. had told me in, in a... You know, a in sort of 20 seconds, the idea of their proof. And I thought, let's try and re recover our own proof without reading their paper, and let's try and do it. And we had some ideas, and then we thought, this would work better for mod 2. Let's not do, do mod 3. Let's do mod 2. And we did, and that's how we got, that's how we proved this thing. And it was, actually came from working on the, the mod 3 problem. Anyway, but what I want to do is, this is now a theorem. I want to tell you the proof. What was known before is, uh, well, this, first of all, this is trivial. That if you don't have any odd holes in your clique numbers 2, then you don't have any odd cycles at all. Because as soon as you have an odd cycle, you take the shortest odd cycle, that's induced. Can you suppose infinitely many odds? So suppose, uh, I mean, can it be true that uh, if you take uh, the whole of length uh, power 2, Wait, wait, so wait a minute, so you, have to get, you have to get the negative straight. What? Say it again. So is this a conjecture? Make it conjecture. Yes. Go then, say it again. I mean, so the strongest conjecture would be that for any infinite family of lengths. Uh, you must have a hole in that family? Uh, right, okay. I mean, that's probably too strong, yeah, but you need some examples, right? Yeah. I Yeah. Don't know. That would be nice. Okay, there's Alon's conjecture is even oh, even yeah, stronger. That I mean, you, if you only want to exclude one graph, then it has to be a forest because there are graphs of big girth and big chromatic number in clique number two, and they won't contain your graph if it's not a forest. So if you only want to exclude one graph, then you, this forest conjecture is the. Well, you can say forest here instead of tree, but that's the best you can do. But if you don't mind excluding a family, then, well, if you don't mind excluding an infinite family with arbitrary cycles of arbitrary length, then you could, you could make up a conjecture like this. And the most natural conjectures are exclude, just exclude families of cycles. And uh, maybe there. It has to be an infinite family. Maybe inf any infinite family would work. I don't know. Uh, that would be nice. Um, Anyway, we worked. This, even this odd holes conjecture was a sort of famous problem for a long time. I worked on it a lot, and other people have worked on it a lot. And, and the, the nice thing is, well, the surprising thing is, you just do the obvious tricks. You do the obvious tricks, and the answer comes out. I mean, <laughs> we don't do anything very tricky. I mean, very, if tricks don't count as being tricky. Uh, you just do the standard things. Anyway, I was telling the background. So if you don't have any odd holes, then you don't have any odd cycles. If you don't have any odd holes, then you don't have any triangles, then you don't have any odd cycles in your bifurcate. This one was a lot harder. This one, um, well, suppose I give you a graph with no odd holes with clique number three. It could contain odd anti-holes. If it doesn't contain odd anti-holes, then it's perfect. And we, well, we don't exactly understand perfect graphs, but at least we can say they're perfect. Um, if it does have an odd anti-hole, it has to be C7 complement. 
because any bigger odd and hill would have a clique of size bigger than three. Um, so you assume it contains C7 complement, then you try to figure out how all the rest of the graph can attach to it. And you're gonna actually figure out, you're gonna actually give a construction for them all. And that's, that's where this came from, getting that construction for the ones, the graphs in this class that aren't perfect. But uh, never mind, that was done. The later cases for omega at least four was, was all open still. Anyway, so the theorem is this. It's uh, at most two to the three to the omega. Um, sorry, but uh, <laughs> that's not bad. But, uh, yeah, so I can prove n to the, ep if the clique number is n, I, c I can prove, if the clique number is omega, I can get a lower bound of something like omega to the 1.3 or something like that. It's not omega square even, but it's not linear. It's o about omega to the 1.3. It's whatever power you have to take 3 to to get 4. So omega to the log 4 divided by log 3. Yeah. Yeah, just blow up. You take C7 complement, keep substituting C7 complements for its vertices, and you keep repeating. And the clique number goes up as 3 to the n, and the chromatic number goes up as 4 to the n. No, no, that's, I haven't tried very hard for, kind of, for examples, but that's, that's a kind of obvious one. Um, so, yeah, I want to actually show you the proof. Um, there's, so we're going to take, assume you've got a graph with bounded chromatic number and huge clique number, and uh, then I'll prove a sort of series of lemmas saying you might as well assume this, we might as well assume that too, we might as well assume the other, and we'll get more and more and more assumptions, and finally we can understand the graphs that satisfy all these assumptions. Um, so the, the hypotheses, I'm going to give you a series of reductions. They're going to look more and more complicated, but the graphs they describe are going to get more and more simple. It's a, um, but there's a lemma I will apply at the end. So let me do the lemma first, just because otherwise it derails me when I get to the end. Let me do the lemma. So a co-graph means a, a graph with no uh, induced four vertex power. No subgraph is, indu is an induced four vertex power. Um, and co-graphs are, I mean, here's how you construct co-graphs. Here's the general construction for all co-graphs. You take two graphs, you've all, two co-graphs you've already made, and you take their disjoint union. Or you take two co-graphs you've already made and take their disjoint union, but make every vertex here com adjacent to every vertex there. So it's sort of disjoint union in the complement. You take complements, take disjoint union, take complements again. And that's, that's a theorem that... Every co-graph can be built that way, and only co-graphs can be built that way. That's, that's a construction for them all. And that's what this says. Well, here's a lemma I'm going, we're going to need later. So, sorry, it looks a bit daunting, but it's actually not so bad. What it says is this. You've got two sets A and B. And there are edges in here. And there are edges up there, but this is stable. And this is the graph G, let's say. And I ha I've got another graph H with vertex set equal to A. It's a graph on this vertex set. And that's a co-graph. Now, the graph G has the property that for every two vertices here, I mean, there might be paths like this. Paths going between them, otherwise contained in the bottom. There might be induced paths like that going between them and otherwise contained in the bottom. Um, so the first property is either all such paths are even or all such paths are odd. Yes? So what's meant by a stable graph? Independent, no edges. Um, so first property is for every two vertices here, either all the induced paths between them are even or all the induced paths between them are odd. That's just a hypothesis. And second, if you look at the pairs where it's odd, that's this co-graph H. So the set of pairs with odd paths between them make a co-graph, right? Is that, so that's, that's what all this says. Uh, plus, plus an assumption everybody here has a neighbor upstairs. 
right? <laughs> no, the, this one is uh, this one is too nasty to put at the end of the talk. By the end of the talk, you're ready, ready for easy stuff. So let me let me uh, explain this one at the start. So uh, then the conclusion is you can partition this into two sets so that every maximum clique meets both halves. Every every clique of maximum size in G. There might not be any cliques in here of size omega g. G is this entire graph. Right? But if there, is, if there are any, any cliques of size omega g in here, they meet both halves. The proof's easy. Let me show, I'll show you the proof. And it's just, you do, in, you do induction on the co-graph. You just, it's either disconnected or it's complements disconnected. So once again, let's pick, pick one case. Let, let's, Let's look at the co-graph and let's assume, uh, let's, let's say all these pairs are odd pairs. All these pairs between left and right are odd pairs. So whenever I take an induced path from here to there, it has odd lengths. The even case is similar. It's just so, so what happens now? There might be people down here. Well, everybody down here has a neighbor up top. Nobody has a neighbor both left and right. Because that would already be an even induced path from left to right, and this was to be all odd pairs. So there are some people down the bottom with neighbors on the left, some people down the bottom with neighbors on the right, but they don't overlap. You know, you get a natural partition of the bottom into two sets. But there could be ages between left and right, so it's not they're not totally independent. It's just the now. Well, I could apply induction to this bit and say I can find a two coloring of the maximum cliques in there. And I could apply induction to that bit and get a two-coloring of the maximum cliques in here. And I can obviously two-color the maximum cliques that meet both left and right, because you just say the left is white and the black is and the, so, no, the left is white and the right is black. <laughs> right? The ones the ones that cross over, you just say this is white and that's black. Hi Abby. Uh, this talk is 15 minutes too, sh too short. I could start again. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> After wasting three hours, uh, doing nothing. Uh, I've just started the proof. I'm proving that if you, don't have a, if you don't have an odd hole, then your chromatic number is bounded by a function of clique number. And first it needs this lemma. It's, this is the first thing I'm, first step of the proof. And I thought I'd prove the lemma. So, you can two-color these guys, you can two-color these guys, so you can two-color those guys. The trouble is, you, you, they're not vertexes joint. You, you might be coloring the same vertex in two different ways. You have to make sure they're vertexes joint. Well, these are vertexes joint from those, but it might be that these meet these guys, the ones that cross over. So that's what I have to check. Can there be a clique on the left that meets a clique that crosses over? They're supposed to be the same size. Sorry, they don't look it in my picture. Well, let's prove not. We'll prove even... There can't even be an omega clique here with a neighbor on the right, let alone a, a clique meeting it and meet containing something on the right. You can't even have one edge like that. Because suppose you do. Well, let's look at his neighbors here. Let's look at all his neighbors. And choose a neighbor for him up there. Now... For all, these, all the people over here he didn't cover, there are some people over there that he didn't cover, because this was already a maximum size clique. If he's adjacent to everybody, that would be a clique of size omega plus one. So there are people here. Look at their neighbors upstairs. Now, take a vertex there. Take, take its neighbor here. Go to one of these. Go to that. Go up. That's a path of four edges. And these paths are supposed to be odd. Not, unfortunately, a contradiction, because it might not be induced. It's the induced paths that have to be odd. But how could it not be induced? This vertex doesn't have any neighbors over there. This vertex doesn't have any neighbors there or there. The only thing that might be wrong is that this vertex might be adjacent to that vertex. So all of these are adjacent to all of those. or else you get an even path. Well, 
That means if I take a vertex here, it can't be adjacent to all of those as well, or else I've got a clique of size omega plus one. So everybody there's got a neighbor and a non-neighbor. Oh, um, all right, nearly there. Choose a vertex here with as many neighbors down the bottom as possible. And he's still got a non-neighbor. And choose somebody else that covers that. He can't have covered all the first people's neighbors because he had as many neighbors as possible. So he's got a non-neighbor there. And what have I just discovered? I've just got discovered two vertices with an edge and an edge and a non-edge and a non-edge. And an edge here. So that's a three vertex induced path which means that this is an odd pair. But it's also got a two vertex induced path. There's a vertex here, and it's an even pair. Contradiction. Right? So it's all it's a nice, easy little, you know, it's, it's quite pretty. And the other case, when you break the co-graph into the, you know, all, such that all the pairs across are even, it's just the same. Just the you know, same level of, of uh, difficulty. Anyway, let's postpone that. We'll come back. Now, um, here's what we want to do. I've got a graph with no odd hole, and I want to prove its chromatic number is only that. Uh, you can make it look better if you do induction. We'll do induction on, the, on omega. So suppose the result's true for graphs with chromatic number less than our graph. Suppose that they're all colorable with n colors. Every graph with no odd hole, with chromatic number, with clique number, less than the clique number of our graph, can be n-colored. And then we'll prove our graph can be 48 n-cube colored. And if you can prove that, and you do work out what the induction gives you, it proves this for you. This looks worse than that. This looks worse than that? You need n-cube. That's what the three up in the exponent is. What would be? It, it would give you a complete of three pairs. Well, it depends. Where does the two come from? Uh, I mean, actually, the truth is, it, it's at most, uh, what you prove is that chi of g is at most one eighth of that. And then, by induction. and then by induction, then the induction goes through. You cube it and you get one over 256 or something, and it, it's big enough to cancel out this 48. And fortunately, the base case is true with one eight. <laughs> um, so that's what we want to prove. That's, we're going to do this induction. Now, here's a thing you can do, standard, first standard trick. You might as well assume the graph's connected. So you choose a vertex, and you take its neighbors, you take their name, classify everybody from, by distance from this vertex. Now, if I could prove that this had chromatic number at most 24 n cubed, and so does that, you know, if, if I could prove all these levels had chromatic number only 24 n cubed, then I'll, I'll take my 48 n cubed colors and divide them into two sets. I'll use First color for this set, second color for that set, first colors for this set, second colors for that set, and it'll work. Right? I can repeat colors at non-consecutive levels because there's no edges between them. So that's what this is. You take a leveling. Leveling is that picture. I mean, here I assumed it contained all the vertices of the graph, but it doesn't. That's just annoying to have to keep adjusting the graph so my leveling contains all the vertices because the leveling will keep shrinking. So let's just say it's the sequence of subsets where everybody's got a neighbor in the previous set, but there's no edges that jump further than that. And there's one vertex at the start. And then we're going to prove that given such a leveling in the graph of no odd holes, the levels have chromatic number at most 24 in cubed. Yeah. Basic question. How do you know there are no edges inside this set? Oh, I don't know that. Is that if I... There are, otherwise they'd be one colorable, not 24 n cubed colorable. I mean, there, there, are, there are edges in here. This, this is a big complicated graph. That's the graph we want to prove is 24 n cubed colorable. It's just, so if it, we might as well, instead of looking at our original graph, we might as well 
look at this graph and try to prove it's got bounded chromatic number. I mean, it still doesn't have any odd holes, and we know a little bit more about it that it's it came from a it's a level in some bigger graph that doesn't have any odd holes. That's a little bit of extra information. And that's so now this is what we need to do. Um, and by a parent, I, I just a parent of this vertex is any one of its neighbors up there. So the, this u is a parent of v. Eh? Just go up one. Now, all right. So where are we? We've got we've got our leveling, and I'm just going to focus on one level, L k, and I'm going to try and prove the chromatic number of L k is not too big. That's what I'm. I'm now not going to worry what's in the rest of these levels. I'm just going to prove the chromatic number of LK is at most 24 n cubed. So, I mean, look at a vertex here. Maybe I can just delete it. If I could just delete it, I'd win by induction on something. Let's, let's do induction on the total number of vertices or something. Uh, and what stops me deleting it? I mean, it must mean if I delete it, that somebody here won't have any parents anymore. If I could delete it and still everybody on the next level had a parent, then I might as well delete it. And so you've got this single parent property that everybody has a child that he's the only parent of. Right? Every, in every level, except the bottom level, everybody has some child that he's the only parent of. He can have other children with many parents, but there's at least one that, that relies on him. Um, and what else can we get from induction? We might as well assume this is connected. Because if it's not connected, just pick a component and throw the rest away. Um, what else? Oh, this parity property. This is a useful property. Because look at two vertices in a level. Non-adjacent. I, I care about the length of induced paths between them. So if they're adjacent, all induced paths between the length one. So let's look at two non-adjacent vertices. You can get a path joining them from below because everybody has a neighbor downstairs until you get to the bottom. And the bottom's connected, so you can join them up there. So there is a path joining them down in the bottom half of the graph, which means you can get an induced path joining them in the bottom half of the graph. It won't necessarily go all the way down to the bottom again. You might have, might have to shortcut it a bit. But there is an induced path. Now look at any path joining them up in the top. If I take an, any induced path joining them in the top, then its union with this thing in the bottom is a hole. So it must be even. There aren't any odd holes. That's a hypothesis. So that means... Every path here has the same parity as that fixed path on the bottom. And in particular, all these paths have the same parity as each other. As each other because you can combine all of them with the path in the bottom. So that's the parity property. Pick any two vertices in a level, and all the paths, all the paths above them in this picture. I don't know if I should call that above or below. I mean, it's definitely lower, right? If you're doing it, because that's, that's the start. This direction is definitely lower, but I guess it counts as above. Uh, let me say above and below. That way I won't confuse myself. Um, so that's the parity property. And so we might as well assume them. You've got the single parent property. You've got the parity property. And we're going to prove the same consequence. Might as well throw them in as hypotheses. And I'm, I don't need... We assume the bottom is connected in order to prove the parity property, but I don't need to maintain that the bottom is connected. We forget that again now. I mean, if I can shrink it some more, then it might not stay connected anymore. But we can assume this. The nice thing about these statements is the hereditary. If I, if I throw away some vertices, you still have these properties. All right, that's where we are now. Now, a spine, let me tell you what a spine is. So, so far, we didn't do anything very complicated, right? 
so far it's just obvious things. Here's my here's my uh, leveling. Now he's got an, a a child that he's the single parent of. In fact, all his children he's a single parent of. But choose one. Now he's got a child he's a single parent of, and so does he. And you can go all the way down to the bottom like this. So let's call this S0, S1, down to SK. That they, that's, that's a path, and SI is the only parent of SI plus 1, for all I. Which means there are no edges like this. You don't have edges like that. Uh, no, wrong way. You don't have edges like that. So if I'm outside here and I have a neighbor on this, on this path, there might be edges like that and there might be edges like this, but there's no edges going downwards. And, and an edge can't go change level by more than one. So the only way you can have a neighbor on the spine is, but it might look like this, you might look like that. So let me list all the possibilities. You might do that, you might do that, you might do both. So there's three kinds of attachment to the spine. And actually, it's helpful also to classify them by the parity of their level. You might be in an even level or an odd level. So I want to think of it as six kinds of attachments to the spine. And so N of S is the people outside the spine with neighbors on it. And these are the possible types of attachment to the spine. Now, what I want to be true is that all these attachments have the same type. I want to arrange that all these attachments have the same type, and I don't like types 5 and 6. What are types 5 and 6? That's, that's this type. That type at even level and that type at odd level. I don't like the ones that just attach straight. I want, I want you to attach upwards. You can also attach straight if you want, but I want you to attach upwards. So it's desirable to produce a spine where all the attachments have the same type and types 1 to 4. So how can I do that? Well, I'm sorry? You don't allow type 5 and type 6? So every vertex has the same type, and it's one of types 1 to 4. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to arrange. I, I mean, so far it's just, that's, that's part of the definition of a spine so far. I was calling this thing a spine, but I shouldn't have, because it has to satisfy that condition. So far it's just a path. I want to persuade it to be a spine, but it's not yet. So, well, what can we do? Oh, I shouldn't have erased all that stuff. OK, here we are again. Now, for every vertex, I mean, it has a, it's got a parent, and he's got a parent, and he's got a parent. And, ev and eventually, you'll run into a neighbor of the spine. So for every vertex, run up until the first time you hit a neighbor of the spine. And look at the type of that vertex. It's got one of these six types. We call that the type of this guy as well. So your type, your type three, if you've got a, if you've got an ancestor, if you can be tracked up to an ancestor of type three without going through any other neighbors of the spine on the way. You look at the first neighbor of the spine you hit. Uh, what? What? It's not unique. No, the type, you might have type 3 and type 4 if there's two different paths to two different types of attachments. I don't care. But every vertex gets at least one type. Um, well, so look at the people down here of type 1. I mean, everybody at the bottom is one of these six types. If I can prove that people of any given type have chromatic number... 4n cubed, then stick them all together, that's my 24n cubed. So I want to prove that for any given type, the people down here of type x have chromatic number at most 4n cubed. That's going to be the next goal. Not yet. Uh, so if I could prove, and so far this is just a path where everybody is the unique parent of the next guy. 
And that, that allows me to define six types of vertices down here. And I, I'd like to prove that each of these types has chromatic number at most four n cubes. If I could prove that, that would give me a total of 24 n cubed for the bottom, and that would be fine. We'll get there. We'll get there. I just, we didn't do that yet. I'm, 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 about, I'm about to arrange it. Wait. Wait. So let's look at, fix a type and look at the, look at the people just of type X. I mean, why is he type X? Um, and maybe he's a neighbor of the spine already, or if he's not, then he's got neighbors of, he's got parents of type X. And they've got parents of type X. Everybody keeps having parents of type X until they get to be neighbors of the spine. So, say he's a neighbor of the spine of type X, but some of them might keep going. Whatever. But for everyone of type X, you can trace them up via type X vertices until you get to a neighbor of the spine. So just focus on those subsets. That's a, another leveling. And in that leveling, uh, uh, all the attachments to the spine do have the same type because you're only keeping the people of type X, except cheated. Um, and part of the definition of a leveling is everyone's got a neighbor in the next level. Well, these guys do, but what about the people that actually have neighbors on the spine? I mean, if, I've, if I'm adjacent to that, well, I, do, I still have a neighbor in the next level. If I'm adjacent to both, I have a neighbor in the next level. But what about the people that look like this? If he's a type X, he doesn't have any parents, maybe, if I'm only restricting myself to the type X people, plus the people in the spine. I restrict myself to the type X people plus the spine itself. Uh, he doesn't have any parents. So, so let's, let's think what that would look like. So now we're just looking at type 5 or type 6 vertices. So type 5, let's say. So then some vertices attach straight out. And they only do it at even gaps, but it's not going to matter here. Some vertices attach straight out. And, uh, and th those are the only people that attach to the spine. Well, take the spine and go, mm, move it up one. And then it's a leveling again. Everybody's got their neighbor in the next level up. Not cheating. <laughs> Looks like cheating, but it's not. So you can always arrange, you've got type, there is a spine and it's types one to four. You, you, you just shift everyone in the spine up one level. And then all these people that didn't have parents, suddenly they do have parents again. And it doesn't mess anything else up. So, so we, can arrange, uh, we can arrange to get a spine. That's how the proof that you, you might as well assume there's a spine but then you have to prove 4n cubed instead of 24n cubed. Right? That's, I guess, the most complicated bit. Did you believe that? That was the surprising bit. That was the bit we were most suspicious of. But, uh, anyway, so now it's enough to prove this. You've still got all these other properties. And we, need, we, we shifted some vertices. So the levels changed a little bit. You have to ver re verify these things and let me not bother. But I mean, these people you moved, you know, they only had uh, one neighbor upwards anyway. So it's not hard to look at, to, to think about them. Um, when you shift them, what happens to, to the top one? Where, you know, well, it moves up to even higher. Um, I mean, shift everyone else down one, if you like. <laughs> this, the leveling gets one level longer. Sorry. Just summarizing what you did there. You took an arbitrary graph, you leveled it, and then you partitioned it to six graphs so that if you can pull for much number of four and cube for each, yes. you would get uh, That's right. And all of these have a spine. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Um, and, and, and these properties that we had before still hold. You have to check you haven't messed them up by types 5 or 6 when you shifted the spine up one notch, but, but, uh, but it works. Let me not bother. Now, um, another, another hypothesis I could throw in. The parent rule. 
whenever you've got two edges, whenever you've got two adjacent vertices in a level, they've got the same parents. They, the parents are exactly the same. So for every two adjacent vertices in the level, they've got the same parents. I want exactly. I want them them to have exactly the same pair. Uh, this is a. This so far it's a definition. That I'll say this level has the parent rule of. So it really means for every connected subgraph here, it's got exactly the same pair. Well, you, uh, if if you mean why is it true for a subgraph if you've got a. Yeah, no, I'm trying to. You say, you're trying to say why is it true? No, so far it's only a definition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, you're, um, so here's a theorem that if you satisfy everything we said so far, then you do satisfy the parent rule. Let me prove it. So let's look at a general level Li. I suppose there's an edge here. And there's this, um, I'm still assuming the spine exists, right? Yeah, this is fine. Um, and there are cases, you know, this vertex, these vertices, one of them might be on the spine, or they might both have neighbors on the spine, or maybe one of them has neighbors on the spine. There's, there's several cases that go through, but they're not hard. Let me just do one. Let me do the case where neither one of them has any neighbors on the spine, but it's, I'm not cheating you very much. All the others are not any harder. So suppose these are, this is U, this is V, and they have no neighbors on the spine. Well, he's, he's got a parent. He's got a parent. He's got a parent. You can keep going up until you hit a neighbor of the spine. And you go up until you might get someone of, you know, depending what pattern you're doing, you, you might be doing this pattern, you might be doing that pattern, you might be doing this pattern. There's really there's re three the possibilities. One is not oh, the second one's not allowed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So you might be doing that. So the, but, but they're all the same. I mean, so let's call this, this is case one and this is case two. So go up from here until I hit a neighbor of the spine and then connect to the spine and come down again. That's an induced path because this was my first neighbor of the spine that I hit. So that's an induced path. And it, if we're doing case one, then it's even. And if we're doing case two, then it's off. So this, this whole thing, this, let's call this P. P is even in case one, odd in case two. So the point is you go up as many times as you come down, but in case two, you do a horizontal edge as well. Um, well, and I'm assuming i is at most k minus 2. There's still two levels below. So that means v, uh, pick a, either, either one of these vertices, it has a child that it's the unique parent of. Also, he has a child that he's unique parent of, namely him. So in particular, that's not an edge and that's not an edge. And you can, from both of them, you can keep on going down until you get to the, until uh, make it connected up. Uh, have I got LK connected? Well, no, I don't even need that. Don't need it. Just go down to here. Stop. 
Now remember, um, we've got the parity property. So this path, we can see what the parity of this path is. If we're in case one, then it's even. If it's case two, in case two, it's odd. So the parity property tells me that all paths between these two, when they go up and around, they're even in case one and odd in case two. Here's another path. You don't start there. You go there and you go left. And now you take his path up to the top and down again. This part was the same length as, as the path for V, I mean mod 2, but I've added one extra edge to it. So the parity's changed. And yet it still gives me an induced path between this and that. How do I know? I took, a, I took a child of V that had no other parents. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say. I'm assuming you and V don't have the same parents. So I'd better use that hypothesis somewhere if I'm trying to prove the parent rule. So, yeah, assume, yeah, let me, see, let me do this again. So assume U has a parent, uh, a parent that's not a parent of V. So I can go up from that and down again, or I can just go up from V and down again. And uh, that will, you know, I want to say that this is an induced path. Well, it's an induced path starting here, but I, want, I need to prove that V doesn't have any neighbors in it. But as long as those two vertices are non-adjacent, then it's true. And that's, uh, that's the parent rule, that uh, any two vertices have, a, have the same parent. And that's a really strong statement. That suddenly made everything trivial. Yes, because because at some time ago we used to be able to complete these through the bottom before we deleted stuff from the bottom and could have used that path to make an auto. Well, not going to need to. I mean, the argument doesn't really, I mean, I needed that, let's see, what did I need? I mean, we didn't have the parent rule for pairs of vertices in the bottom. We just had it for there. So if I'm already in the second to bottom thing, I can't do this trick of going down one, it wouldn't work. And you can try and fiddle it some other way, but, but there's a cheap fix. So let me show you the cheap fix. Um, anyway, it's enough to, so now we might as well prove this. We can assume that all the levels down to k minus 2 satisfy the parent rule. And now I can throw away some of the other hypotheses. I don't need the spine anymore. Uh, what else was there? Oh, I forgot. There was another, some, oh, the single parent property. I don't need the single parent property anymore. So some hypotheses I'm just forgetting. Anyway. I mean, they're still true if you want them, but we don't need them anymore. So now it would be enough to prove this. How can you have the parent rule and uh, single child property? It's not a single child. Everyone has a child that he's the only parent of. Yeah, everyone has a child that is. How are they consistent? Why are they not consistent? Yeah. You just threw away the, the single parent property. And I'm just wondering whether if you kept it and had also the parent rule, you don't get some is a nicer part. Well I don't I mean here's a level, so there's a vertex. He has a child that he's the only parent of, and that child could be in a connected component, and they'd all have him as their only parent, but that might happen. But but there, are, but there are other people joined to him, which don't have him as the unique parent. So they can have more neighbors up here. I mean, it's not that everybody here has a unique parent. It's just that for everyone there, there is someone here with a unique parent. 
<laughs> oh, if it were connected, that would tell you a lot. Yeah, yeah, but it's not connected. Um, so it's enough to prove this. How are we doing for time? So now watch this. Boing. Um, what happened? I'm going from 4n cubed to 4n squared, so we're going to have to prove something a bit stronger. But I'm throwing in another assumption that L k minus 2 is stable. So how can I get L k minus 2 to be stable? <laughs> stable, I mean, independent. Well, no, does nobody know what stable means anymore? That used to be the standard word. I mean, <laughs> let's look at LK minus 2. Um, we know this has the parent rule. So it can't have an omega clique, because suppose there's an omega clique. Well, they have, they've got a parent, they've all got the same parent. That's an omega plus 1 clique. There's not supposed to be any of them. So in this level, you don't have any maximum clique, so you could color it. Partition it into n stable sets. So this is stable. This is n sets. Right? And I'll just look at the grandchildren of each one of these sets. Just pick one of these sets and trace down who it leads you to. And that's, a, that's another leveling with the LK minus 2 level stable. So if you could prove for that that this was colorable with 4N square colors, then you know, there's N of these. It divides the bottom into N sets. That would be 4N cubed for the bottom. So we can assume, we can assume LK minus 2 is stable. And here's LK that we care about. Now, what about LK minus 1? It would be nice if we could get that to be stable. But I mean, either it's got big chromatic number or small chromatic number. If it's got big chromatic number, forget LK. Let's prove, let's worry about LK minus 1. And if it's got small chromatic number, divide it up and look at the children of each set. So if you could prove, suppose you could prove, so note the change. I'm going from LK minus 2 to L, oops, to LK minus 1 being stable, and I'm going from 4N squared to 2N. If we could prove that, then we could get what we really wanted, which was the previous thing. We could get that. Because, suppose, suppose we can prove whenever you're, the level immediately above you is stable, your chromatic number is at most 2N. So then this level, LK minus 1, is 2N colorable. And now you look at the children of each of these, and each, and for, it, for those, their parents are stable, so they're 2n colorable. And then you've got 2n sets here, each of them 2n colorable, that's 4n square. So if we could only prove this, then we'd be done, right? And, well, another nice fact. So, so that's what we're going to. That's what we're going to look at now. We've got LK minus 1 stable. So LK that we want to know, we're trying to prove the chromatic number of LK is at most 2N. And we've got all this other stuff on top. Now, theorem. Not quite. For any two vertices here, there might be even paths between them and there might be odd paths between them, but there's not both because we've still got the parity property. So you get some even pairs and some odd pairs. Um, and let's call the graph of jumps the graph, the graph made by the odd pairs. Say, say two are adjacent in this graph if, there's an odd, if the paths between them are odd. And it's well defined because there certainly is a path between them. If all else fails, you just go way that back to the top and down again, you can certainly get through. So say the graph of jumps is just, you say two of them are adjacent if there is an odd induced path between them in the top half of the graph. Theorem. Suppose you've got all the hypotheses we had in that, then 
the graph of jumps is a co-graph. And for that, I don't even need LK. Suppose I've just got, I'm just going to look at LK minus 1. Suppose I've got those hypotheses. What do I have to do to prove that's a co-graph? I have to prove it doesn't have a, an indu in the graph of jumps, you don't get an induced four vertex path. So suppose you get a, this is an odd pair. This is an odd pair. That's an odd pair. And the other three are even pairs. It's an induced four vertex path. We'll start here and follow that path up. He's got a parent, he's got a parent, he's got a parent. Go all the way up to the root. Now start here. He's got a parent, he's got a parent, he's got a parent. Eventually these two paths meet. How can they? And before they meet, there's an edge between them. You know, immediately before they meet, there's an edge between them. Um, and it can't be an edge like that, because that would give you an even induced path. It has to be a horizontal edge. First, the first time they meet is a horizontal edge. And I don't care about the rest of it. Let's stop it there. And this, I don't know how high I have to go before it. Now start tracing this guy up and follow it until, until he has a neighbor in this set. Could he miss it? Could he just overshoot? Suppose he overshoots. Missed. No edges to there at all. Well, these two have the same parent. So start from that parent and go up until this joins up. And now I've got an induced path here, an induced path there. Same length, exactly same length. And yet that's supposedly an odd pair, and that's supposedly an even pair. So it couldn't overshoot. On the way up, it has to have neighbors over here. Maybe, I don't know where it is. There's going to be some vertex. I haven't drawn enough levels. But somewhere on this path up, before we get to the, the horizontal bar, we have to get to a vertex here with neighbors on the neighbors in this U thing. The same level, right? I'm sorry? The same level, well, it can have more than one neighbor. It can, it can have neighbors on this and neighbors on that. I mean, it's more complicated. You can analyze it. But, uh, and the same for this guy. You follow it up and see where it has. And now, and now you, no, I'm not going to tell you any more of the proof. You stare. It. It, it's not very hard, but it takes a couple of pages. Yeah, you just can't, you can't make these attachments fit all together so that all these six pairs have the right parities. Well, all right, so now where are we? It's a co-graph. Here's LK minus 1 again. Let's put LK back. There's all this other stuff up here. Now, if I look at two vertices there, Say it's an odd pair in this co-graph. That means the paths here are odd. That means the, if, if I see any induced path like that, that must be odd as well. We don't know that there is a path in the bottom anymore because we've thrown away stuff in the bottom. We stopped it being connected and what have you. But, but if there is any induced path in the bottom, it has to be odd as well because it has to match this path in the top. And similarly for even pairs. So... The graph of jumps on this tells you the parity of the jumps below as well as the parity of the jumps above. And that's this, uh, what's that? That's, that's, I'm just saying again what we need to prove. We, we've got the graph of jumps on this as a co-graph. Remember this theorem. And now, now you say, well, I can two-color this so that every maximum clique in the bottom meets both colors. S consequently, in the left, there isn't any maximum clique, and I can n-color it. And on the right, there's no maximum clique, and I can n-color it, so I can two n-color the bottom totally. So isn't that a nice proof? I mean, it's quite pretty. Several pretty steps. It's nothing very hard. I mean, that's surprising for such an old conjecture. I mean... If you compare that with the proof of the perfect graph theorem, which, which should have been prettier, because that's a nice natural conjecture, and this is horrible, the proof of the perfect graph conjecture was, is really a mess, and this one is sort of elegant. I quite like this proof. Anyway, all right, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>